There is a myriad of things that can go wrong when you install your own head unit. What was just shown was not meant to scare you off. This is a fun and rewarding project that saves you a ton of money and teaches you a lot. There's a wealth of information in this video. Sit through and dig into the details. Today, we comprehensively install a head unit. We do the basics, like the head unit, but we also show you how to remove the center console, wire the rear camera, repair broken connectors on the fiber optic box, remove things when they get stuck. That happens more often than I'd like, by the way. Before I hop right in, I also want to share that you can check the comments for updated information, because as people share their experience, there's going to be a wealth of knowledge there that's worth reading through. We're installing a head unit already designed for the 987, so the connectors are mostly plug and play. I'll link a PDF in the description if you also need the wiring instructions for installing generic head units into your 987. For mine, it was mostly a kit without having to mess with as many wires. Keyword, as many. The table of contents is also in this video's description, and all of the videos are linked there. We're first going to cover just the head unit installation. The head unit installation guide is going to cover what you need to know for the basics of installing the new head unit. There are useful tips in this section because it's easy to get stuck on certain steps, and I want you, the viewer, to have an easy time with them by learning from what I did. Examples were it being difficult to get the old head unit out, not knowing which wires to wire the fiber optic box to, if you have specific speakers, stuff not working for weird reasons, and the connectors on the fiber optic box breaking off, which happened to me and was a big problem that we show how to solve. We're then going to cover the center console. In the center console section, we show how the whole process of removing it, then installing USB ports, then reinstalling it goes. Halfway through, you'll have to pause, skip ahead to the rear camera wiring, then come back to the center console part of the video for the reinstallation. I did this for simpler organization of this video to logically group the center console material together. We cover removing the rear bumper because we show you how to install a rear camera that looks OEM and is actually integrated into the bumper. I didn't find a good guide on wiring the rear camera, so I made one. The rear camera chapter shows installing it into the bumper and actually wiring everything. The antenna chapter has the guide on connecting and placing the antennas. The is it worth it section explores the before and after. Spoiler alert, it's worth it, but there are things to look out for and caveats. The appendix is important to watch because it's going to contain all the extra details that will make life more reliable and easy. I offloaded more detailed scenarios there so you can specifically find what you need instead of having to sit through it in the main part of the video. You can click on the chapters in the description to skip around. Subtle text packaged very thoroughly like they do it in Kazakhstan. Every single metric inch centimeter covered in tape. Here's how it all arrives. It's surprisingly light. This has a nice tactile feel to it. This is not a button. SD card slot. Connector that goes into the head unit for reverse camera and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth antennas on these connectors. A wire for connecting the antenna. Female USB connectors for plugging in your phone, charging, or plugging in USB sticks. The MOST or the fiber optic box. You'll need this if you have Bose speakers because that means you have a fiber optic system. The main connector for the speaker lines, which includes the SIM card receptacle so you can have wireless internet data anywhere, or place calls. The main communication and power connectors that go from the head unit to the car's power and computer. This is how the head unit is going to tell the car what's playing and what's currently activated, like USB. This is the GPS antenna. That is the 4G LTE antenna. On the right are clips, and these will be important. We're going to remove this panel on the passenger on the right side using a T27. It's a hidden screw, so you just look around and feel around in the hole, and it should click in. As it comes loose, we just remove this, and we detach this plug by squeezing on the two plastic connectors. It pulls right out. Now we do the same thing on the left side. We just feel around for this little hole here. 
just wiggle it a little. This little bracket goes on here. So you might just have to use two hands, hold it in place, and then reinstall it. So we'll just keep these two as a set. Check out the video logs for these workbenches. Next, we're going to remove these leather clad side panels and they are attached using two T20, regular T20 Torx heads. Both Torx. There are three clips, one, two, and three, and you want to be uniformly applying pressure from the middle out towards the front. The objective is to disengage one, two, three clips without breaking them, hopefully in place. So I'm pulling. And if you haven't taken these panels out in a while, the clips might be a little finicky. There we go. Successfully broken none of them. Do the driver's side. And stay organized to make life easy. We pull a little at the bottom first to disengage the bottom clips because all three didn't come out at once. And clip in, clip integrity check. All three clips are good. And this is what your boxer should look like at this point. Remove the small screw on the right side. Clearance is going to be tight. Lengthwise, it will be tight. It almost rests against a glove box when fully unscrewed. Congratulate yourself because you finally found a use for the adjustable wrench, aside from it being a paperweight. Open the glove box to remove the screw. Once the screw is out, we're supposed to press on the four clips on the left and right sides of the head unit, shown here, and slide the head unit out, and it's supposed to be easy. This is complicated by a few things, including difficulty of reaching all of the clips. I recommend an Allen key, which makes it easy to press the clips in on the driver's side due to the trim surrounding the steering wheel being in the way. Another issue is the clip retainers. You can do this alone, assuming your clip retainers don't break. The clip retainers are circular bits of plastic next to each clip that can be turned by an Allen key. Again, the clip retainers on the left are difficult to reach, and the clip retainer on the top left is the hardest to reach of them all due to the trim piece. An Allen key helps to apply the pressure. My clip retainers were old and worn, and you're supposed to be careful because if you turn them too far, you break them off like I did or they break from old age. It's a challenge because the clips are very firm and the retainers are actually quite weak and it's easy for the clips to push them out. You can turn all four clip retainers and hope they hold and pull the head unit out or you can do what I did, which is get lucky on a couple of the clip retainers and ask for help on pushing in on the rest of the clips on both sides simultaneously and pull since I couldn't get the plastic clip holders to actually hold down the clips in all places. Congratulations, you just passed a medium difficulty milestone. For the next step, we're going to disconnect the wires, which is mostly easy, but if you have the orange fiber optic connection, you'll need to be careful because the wire gets disconnected very particularly. The first connector has thin wires, and those are your CAN bus signal wires, which talk to the computer, and your ignition wire, which we'll have to tap into later. It's removed by disengaging the clips on either side of the connector using a flathead screwdriver. Next, the main power main ground connection comes out, also using a flathead screwdriver like shown. After that, the fiber optic connector becomes easy. It releases by pressing in on the tab. It's a bit of a chore to remove it if you plug it back in. At this point, feel free to disconnect the wiring retainer. It's going to make your life easier when you wire into the ignition and with putting all of the connectors back in when we put it all back together. So next we're going to test our new awesome looking head unit. We've pre-made three labels, B+, ACC, and ground, and we'll be soldering in the MO. ST adapter, if you have a fiber optic connection, which I do, into the wires once we figure them out with a voltmeter. Ah, uh, this is exciting. Car play in the car. Let's do our test run. 
We have a triple pin design. Two cables that we're gonna use are on this side, and we have two metal pins here, so that goes here. Power and everything only goes one way in with the clip on the left. The middle connector is not used. So that, and there we go. Buttons light up, and that was fast. Oh, that's so exciting. Oh, the display is super responsive. Oh, that is super nice and super exciting. I want to point out a sound-related issue to be aware of at this point before we get too far. So as shown on the Planet 9 thread, Don points out that on some Bose systems, the volume of the output is controlled by the Bose amp. The head unit simply sends the signal to the amp to raise or lower the volume. So basically there's a maximum volume there. Whatever the gain was set to on the amp by the old hand unit is going to be all it's capable of. So to get it working correctly, reinstall the old head unit at this point, turn the volume all the way up, we're just setting the amp gain, then turn the car off and remove the key. Then you can upgrade your head unit again and it should have the proper maximum volume. Here we'll show how to check for 12 volts, ground, and ignition. First, check for ground. Get a voltmeter and set it on continuity, which is this little picture. You can check it's in continuity by touching the two prongs together, and you should hear a beep. Touch one voltmeter prong to the black wire, and the other to anything metallic on the inside of the door jam. Next, we'll confirm the 12 volt wire. Set the voltmeter to direct current 20 volts and set one prong on the confirmed ground wire and the other prong to the half red, half green wire and have it confirm 12 volts. Careful not to touch them to not short your car. The ignition wire is the green wire on the communication connector. With one prong on the voltmeter connected to the ground on the main connector, the other prong goes to this little green wire that we're testing. With the key removed, confirm it reads zero volts. Insert the key into the ignition, and now confirm that it reads 12 volts. Congrats, you verified your connections. Onto the radio. Now it's wiring time. First, we'll show you how the main connectors work. Then we're going to cover the fiber optic adapter in case you have Bose. Then we're going to connect the radio, our two newly added USB ports, the rear camera, and show you where the GPS and cell phone antennas go. If you're wondering where the USB and rear camera wires came from, this is the head unit section of the video. And the USB wires are in the center console chapter. And the rear camera installation is in the rear camera chapter. I did this to keep all the head unit stuff together. The main plug's job is power and communicating with the car's computer. On the Porsche side, that looks like two connectors, one for power and one for communicating with the car. Depending on which old head unit model you have, you'll have slight variation in how those look. The head unit I'm using comes with two plugs, which are wired to the same connections on the head unit. So the head unit is universally compatible with the old 2.1 and with the 3.0. We can lop off the extra connector on our new universally compatible head unit to save space. In this guide, we're using the Extron head unit as an example, but here's a pinout diagram if you're installing a different head unit. I'll also include this image in the description. The Porsche standard is thick brown is ground, and a thick half red, half green cable is the main 12 volts. On the new head unit, that goes to the bottom half of the connector. You can line it up by using black as ground on the head unit, and on the head unit, the power is yellow. So we line up the Porsche standard and the new head unit standard together. If you're wiring in a different head unit, at this point, you'll need your pinout diagram. The second Porsche connector only has four little wires. The green one is ignition for future reference. The leftmost two wires are the CAN bus signal wires, and we line those up with the leftmost wires on the new head unit. We will be tapping into the ignition later, if you have a fiber optic box. If you don't have a fiber optic box, you'll have a third connector that simply plugs into the middle of the connector. Since I have fiber optic, I instead have an orange cable that we'll show now. 
If you have a Bose sound system, the orange cable goes into the fiber optic box. Wiring in the fiber optic box for sound is easy if you know which wire is the ignition and if your fiber optic box connectors don't break. Fast forward to the appendix and back because I included guides on what to do if yours breaks and how to fix it and which parts you will need. Solder the 12 volts aka B plus wire on the fiber optic box into the 12 volt yellow wire on the head unit connector side. Solder the black ground wire on the box into the black ground wire on the head unit connector. And then don't solder. Use a T-junction connector for the ACC wire on the fiber optic box and connect that to the car's side green wire on the communication connector. We unfortunately have to do this because the Extron does not have a connector for this. If I were to improve the Extron's design, I would insert a pin into the head unit side connector and leave a trailing wire to solder into. Extron, if you're watching this, please take note and add a trailing wire where the Porsche ignition is. If you have the fiber optic box, at this point you'll want to connect the audio left out and audio right out connectors on the head unit side to the aux line in on the fiber optic box. Included with the Extron head unit is an adapter to the Porsche Fakra or Fakra connector, aka radio connector. If you don't have one of these connectors, you'll need to adapt to the radio connector, aka Fakra, Fakra, to whatever your new head unit uses, USB, Uzba. See the center console chapter for instructions on how to install USB extensions and a port into your center console. The end result should be a center console with USB ports coming out of it. The head unit comes with two USB cables. On one end, they should plug into the head unit and on the other, they should have USB connectors. This is how you route the USB connectors to the head unit through the head unit area. The end result should be USB connectors in the passenger footwell that are connectable to the center console. Once you connect everything, congratulations, you now have USB. It will depend on the head unit you get, but for this Xtron, we'll create documentation where none existed and indicate that the white connectors are all specifically sized. So it will be impossible to accidentally mix the main connector with the USB with the rear camera. Rear camera. To plug in the rear camera on the head unit side, we use the included connector with the yellow wire. From the car side, we will have a newly installed yellow RCA signal wire with a rear camera activation wire whose installation we cover in this video in the rear camera section. This part was a bit painful due to lack of documentation, but thanks to online resources and trial and error, more than I care to admit, we got it working. If you have an automatic transmission, the rear camera should work without the activation wire. I'll link the forum where I found that information in the description. If you have a manual transmission, you need to wire the activation wire into the brown wire, which goes into the CAN bus on the Xtron head unit side. Some online forums say it's the pink wire labeled park, but it is not. If you have a different head unit, it, please confirm with your hopefully provided documentation on the new head unit which wire is the rear camera activation wire. Don't be me. Don't buy head units without documentation from Alibaba. Or make sure you subscribe to Ruslan Video Films because Ruslan will try and fail until he succeeds, then share what works. The rear camera activation wire also has to be a T-junction connector because the rear camera wire is a car side wire now and it connects into the head unit, a head unit side connection. So to make sure that the head unit is removable in the future, we need the ability to plug and play. I soldered the wire into the male connector on the T-junction connector for reliability. GPS and 4G antenna. The GPS and 4G antenna connectors are straightforward and are labeled on the head unit. Watch the video section on antenna installation to see how they're installed. Not a hard process. And congratulations, that is it for wiring. Now we're going to install the new head unit into the space of the old one. The head unit includes tabs in the package that are meant to replace the installed tabs. Take care not to lose these screws. Replace the pre-installed tabs with the tabs included in the package on the head unit. You'll notice that even with the bigger tabs, the head unit wobbles, and that's not good. Thanks to Don Eilenberger and his thread at Planet 9, we have two fixes. If you don't have special 3D printed rails, Don used 3 16 thick pieces of foam rubber on each side of the unit case, and some very small strips of 1 thick rubber on either side of the bezel. 
I emulated the solution and had acceptable results, but my head unit still wobbled around. The second solution, however, is 3D printed rails. Community members designed 3D printed rails specifically for this head unit and open sourced the design files. So I downloaded the readily available files, huge thanks to them, sent them over to a 3D printing service on the internet, and a week and a half later, I had the rails in my mailbox from Kansas. These screw in on the sides. They improve on a serious shortcoming of this head unit, which was loose fitment. Turn sloppy, loose fitment into actual OEM like fit. Awesome. Regardless of solution, we mount the clips, rails, or foam and slide the head unit in. If you have the foam, you can play around with the placement to minimize wobbling. Rinse and repeat until the seating of the head unit in the rails is accurate and to your liking. The key is patience and not forcing it in. And there we go. After a few tries, oh, it's nice. It's nice and flush and nothing is actually pushing it out. Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. So the other ones also wobble, maybe not as much. Oh, I will, I will take this any day. This is nice. Push these clips out as much as possible. Now, voila, barely any motion. Here. Press in. Just align the three. Lower it, and then there we go. And boom. Let's take the top and the bottom. No need to over tighten. Reconnect the cigarette plug. Swapping over to. T27. Clip has broken up or slipped off, no worries. Just get it on there. Get your carpet piece in position. Get it under. Get your gentle power tool. And there we go. My car has always had gaps like this, even before reassembly. I even took everything apart and repainted it and really tried to get it perfectly back in there. From above, you can't see these gaps and I've basically lived with it, but I also do not, do not like these visible clips. If anybody has tips on how to actually fix them, please let me know. Congratulations, you've made it to the end of the head unit section. Don't forget to check out the appendix. Next, we're going to cover removing and reinstalling the center console in order to install USB ports and wire the rear camera. Welcome to the center console portion of this video. In this part, we're going to show you how to remove and install the center console, how to add in USB ports, and share tips on the difficult parts. It's not mandatory to remove the center console to wire a rear camera in, but you'll get a cleaner result. I did it all at once, removed the head unit, center console, rear bumper, and wired everything in, then put everything back together. We're about to disconnect the battery and remove the center console. But before we do that, since the convertible top button is on the center console and we're going to need service mode later, it's suggested to put the car in service mode before you remove the button. The full video walkthrough on service mode is available on my channel as well. Pop the front trunk and disconnect the battery by removing the negative terminal. I like to disconnect both terminals, first the negative, then the positive, and put them both in cotton gloves so they are insulated for safety. Remove the shift boot and shift knob. Do this by prying up from the front side of the car. This can be a bit tricky. It's better to continue to try and pry from the front of the car because there are clips at the back that break. Ask me how I know that. There's going to be a black plastic piece hidden under the shift boot, attaching the boot to the knob. Pull the shift boot up a bit over the knob. Turn the hidden plastic piece 90 degrees clockwise. This will allow the entire thing to release and slide out from on the shift lever. Next can be a challenging part 
That looks easy for me because I already got it loose last time. Pull the whole thing off and you should have the shift boot and knob in one hand. If your shift knob is stuck on the lever, that's common. See my other detailed video on tips on removing the shift boot and knob. There, we share different ways to get it off if it's stuck. Next, there's the center console extension trim piece that's shown in black over the silver trim. There are six clips. Pry up, not side to side, to remove the six clips. Start from the clips closest to you and work back for ease of removal. These are stubborn clips and they're easy to get frustrated with and tempting to move side to side in an attempt to remove them. But you can snap them if you do so if you don't have success. If you don't have success, you can try using a larger plastic pry tool. Once unclipped, the trim piece should be easily removable by pulling it up and out. It might flex a little side to side over the main head unit area. Large clip, small clip, large clip. Next, we're going to remove the silver console trim. This is held in place by four Torx screws. Once we make quick work of those four, the trim is held in place by more clips that we pry up. It comes up and out. The climate control is super easy. There are tabs on the left and right sides of the climate control unit. If you press on those, the climate control slides out and you can detach the connectors at the back by pressing down on their tabs and pulling. They only go back in one way, so you don't even need to worry about what order the connectors go in. To remove the spoiler and stability module control piece, press in on the tabs on the sides and disconnect the connectors. They also only go back in one way. With the storage bin screws in a tackable position and the upper components out of the way, remove the Torx screws left and right of the storage bin. We removed the upper components so we didn't have to press down on the storage compartment tab and possibly bend at the storage compartment. Pull the storage bin out. Shaping up nicely. Remove the Torx screw that was under the storage bin towards the front of the car. Remove the Torx screw on the front left of the center console. Remove the symmetrical screw on the front right side. Open the center compartment and remove the rubber mat. That will expose four Torx screws that need to be removed. These are T20. If you have the iPod aux kit, the fourth Torx screw might be hiding underneath the black panel. You do not need to disconnect the iPod aux kit yet. We can do that later when the center console is off. For now, we just need to get the Torx screws out. A flathead screwdriver makes quick work of the connector holding in the iPod aux kit if you have it. Under the banana, which we pop out now with a finger, remove the Torx screw. This was the last Torx screw holding the center console in. The last step before removing the center console is disconnecting the console wiring. This is why we had to disconnect the battery earlier, because once we disconnect this connector and try and start the car, we'll get an airbag warning. No big deal if you forget, you can reset the airbag light on your own using the iCarSoft scanner tool linked in the description. The center console wiring is inserted into the black plastic bracket at an angle. The tab at the bottom of the connector is inserted at about 45 degrees. The connector for the wires is stubborn. I had luck by removing it from the tab by rotating it and wedging a fingernail and separating the two connectors while pushing down on the left side tab then wiggling on the right side while pressing down on the right side tab and rinsing and repeating and wiggling it out. If you have difficulty, keep up at this step. Play around with getting fingernails in. Eventually, it comes disconnected. Leave a comment below if you need more help. The center console will now be removable. Two problem areas with removal are the handbrake and the front legs of the center console. 
while watching the front legs of the console lift up from the back, making sure it clears the handbrake to avoid scratches. This shouldn't be too hard, but you might have difficulty on it catching somewhere where you're not looking. Just be sure to look around, be careful not to scratch the handbrake, don't bend the legs too much, and it should come right out. Installing Uzba. For installing USB, a popular option is installing the ports into the passenger foot well, shown here. I went a bit against the grain and sacrificed the center console compartment's 12 volt plug for ease of use and because my 12 volt plug was already sacrificed. I had the aux kit built into my Boxster before the new head unit, and the aux kit covers this 12 volt plug, so I was already living with two 12 volt plugs, one near the emergency brake and the other in the passenger foot well instead of three. Installing the USB ports was easy thanks to this extension kit, which puts USB in any 12 volt hole. The old socket comes out with the help of this mallet, and the extension kit has a plastic nut that holds it in place. It's not a perfect fit because the socket is rounded, but you can't really tell unless you examine it very closely, and I accepted that trade-off for utility, since the car will look stock when the compartment is closed anyway. Now that our car is wired for USB, take our two head unit USB connectors, route the USB cables down through that hole in the middle here, reaching around and pulling them through. And we have plenty of slack to spare for the head unit. We have to leave the USBs in an accessible area, so I'm gonna leave the connections in the bottom right. These plugs are basically a one-way connection, very painful to remove from the head unit, so we'll just tuck them away. And congratulations. You now have USB, your 987. Reinstalling the center console is easy. Skip ahead now to the rear camera if you haven't done so yet, because we're about to reinstall and we're assuming that you've wired everything you need to wire with the center console out. While I had the center console out, I also upgraded my shifter cables to numeric cables, and that guide is in the works and will be on the channel as well soon, so subscribe so you don't miss it. Back on the topic of reinstalling the center console, first we navigate it into position by orienting the legs of the center console down, and by orienting the emergency handbrake through the handbrake opening on the console. The two main things to remember at this step are, the center console is navigated over the emergency brake, and it loves to get caught on the seats on the sides. If your center console isn't going back in, it's because it's caught on the seats most likely. If you push the seats outwards, the center console should slide back in. You'll notice, now we have additional USB wires in addition to the existing center console connector. Reinstalling the connector is a breeze compared to removing it. Click the connector in, then rotate the tab into the hole on the metal bracket, and done. And your new USB connectors are there. Time for the reinstallation. Enjoy this reversed footage of me using power tools to reinstall everything and using screwdrivers to reinsert stuff. I don't know why I lost some of the footage, but I had to reverse some of these clips. I definitely do not recommend using power tools to reinstall all of these torques. I recommend tightening them by hand, but the written instructions as they appear are accurate. All of the connectors go back in one way as mentioned earlier specifically for the button controls for the spoiler, as well as the Porsche stability management control, as well as the climate control unit. Both of these units basically slide right in, all the connectors click in one way and into place. And then we simply reinstall the silver console trim. I can be seen using a prior at some points, but all you need to do for the clips is basically push them in without having to pry and they should click right in. After the silver console trim is the black trim, here we are guilty of using the prior with the reversed footage. You don't need to, you just press it in. Careful not to flex left and right. With the shift boot, we install it at an angle and then turn it counterclockwise about 90 degrees to click 
the black plastic piece into place, and then we install the clips closest to us first, and then the farthest clips. After that, it's as straightforward as reconnecting the battery, and we are done with the center console reinstallation. We watch Ruslan's full-length video on how to exit service mode, how to put the carpet and all of the panels back to where they belong, and that's it. That concludes the center console portion. Next up, we turn our sights to the rear bumper, completely removing it, because we bought a flush mount camera that looks OEM, and we show you how to mount it, install it, and run the wire through the inside of the 987. I just wiggle it out. fine precision collection. And what I'm doing is I'm pressing in all the way. See how it went in? All the way. I'm just gonna take a finger in and pry. You don't want to damage anything so I'm being very careful with what I press against. Push. Look at that. Pin did go inside, so we're going to fish it out momentarily. Pin goes inside. Popped out. Pin goes inside. Popped out. Fingernail until it catches. If you don't have a fingernail, ask your wife. If you don't have a wife, ask your girlfriend. And I know you have a girlfriend because you have a poor show. Boxer came in 987. Took a little bit of wrestling to finally break loose under one clip, but still took some wrestling probably due to age. So prying it up. There we go. And glove four. We can start lifting this. And now we can start lifting this and finagling it and pulling it basically back towards you and it pops right off easy peasy let's set the spoiler aside for a second because let me show you something The tips, the tips to these plastic clips that we took out have been safely caught inside the spoiler. There's one and there's two. And we got the other one. 13 millimeter. Before we completely remove, they are colored with a red indicator. So that is where the nuts go. It's painted in red around it. So we're going to want to do a final test fit before we completely reassemble. Congratulations, your spoiler is out. Put these in a safe spot. Remove the Torx screws that were previously under the spoiler. I did not find a way to do this without the spoiler removed.
In the right tail light, there's this T40 and that T40. Remove this bracket by simply lifting and pulling out. And to reinstall, it's going to be at an angle. Just lift, insert, and like this. Lift and pull out. T40 is on the driver's side as well. Lift and remove. On the right side, one, two, three. Right angles are awesome. On the left and right sides, there is a screw hiding inside the wheel wells towards the top back. It helps to put a camera into the wheel well to see it and to use the camera as a viewfinder for locating the screw. It's going in and it's hidden right there. So now we're gonna get at it. And then we're gonna remove the rest of it. I'm gonna use a flexible, flexible bit. Hold it again with my finger. Clicked in. That's a little too much force, so we're gonna switch to something gentler. Ah, but it broke loose. It did break loose. And we can get it with our hands. To reinstall, we're probably gonna jack up. Just a little bit, just this side, just to give us more space. So the angle is like this. I used Cayman instructions as a reference, which were different on the 97, so that's why I have eight holes here. I'm going to do my due diligence. Check on the right side. Aha, uh -huh. so the Boxster does have a Twix on the right side, but the Cayman instructions do not. The Twix, which is a standard screw head thingy, to a tiny hex wrench, to a tiny angled hex wrench, to a tiny hex wrench extension, to an adapter back to the Twix head that fits in a standard screwdriver. This one was a challenge, because it was pretty stuck pretty well. I broke it loose with this guy. The great part is if you hold the metal outside, this doesn't spin, but the inside does. So you don't damage anything, and you can place it along the bumper here. Great tool, I'll link it below. Okay, on the Boxer 987.1, left wheel well, right wheel well, three each side, three on top behind the spoiler, and the tail light bolts. Yeah, we should just be able to. Shake the bumper. Pops outwards on the back. Pops outwards on the back here. We just grab it and pull it towards us a little bit. Outwards and towards us. We just need to get it off the sides. Like that. Bumper comes off. Something slides out there. We just disconnect these lights from the back. Plastic is brittle and hard and it's become attached. So I'm going to try to remove the connectors at the lights. And that gives me more luck. Huzzah! So we're basically going to put the hole for the rear camera here, run that wire along here into over there, and we're going to have to figure out how to wire the rear camera a little bit better and think about it a little more. And this is a terrific opportunity to clean the bumper up. for the wiring. Reinstall the rear lights for the license plate. Now when you're positioning the bumper, so 
set down this cable for reattachment to the rear lights. Pull the bumper a little closer to reconnect your number license plate lights. Okay. Pull it up and rest it on the exhaust if you want. And this goes under this. The pins I guess pulled around this. Pull under this, the pins align. Like so. The hardest part was going back between the right, adjust the right, and adjust the left, and going back and forth a little bit. If you're like me, quickly pull off the bumper and reinstall this vent. So in post, we're gonna make sure, don't forget this black vent, because it's important and it keeps water and other debris out of your car. So, might have to pull it off and reinstall the bumper real fast. I think for a snug and trim and accurate fit, what we're going to need to do is install the same way we removed. So first, I think we're going to need to cheat a little to get access to this bolt. So first, we're going to reinstall the left wheel well Torx. Make sure this gap is nice. With the car chalked up, bumped up, not even raised off the ground. And that gives us the clearance we need to reinstall the, to install the Torx. I'm using my camera as a viewfinder. Hmm. Yes. Let's make sure the panel is perfect. There we go. Now the gap is consistent. Camera has the viewfinder, long pokey stick, adjust the bumper in a little for it to fit. Sorry for the shaking, filming at the same time. Attach handle. Get the Torx in the thing again. Almost all the way. So even though for removal, we did the bottom Torx next, we're actually going to do the left and right taillights Torx bits because we care more about the alignment at the top visually than if the bumper is perfectly aligned at the bottom. So first we're going to do the left taillight then the right taillight for the nice consistency of these lines on both sides. And then the top Torx for alignment. And then finally the bottom left taillight. Power tool on a very forgiving setting. Bracket and left tail light. Bracket goes in the same way. And for the right tail light. Those three go in the top. The bottom three. here, here, and here in the middle of this black bar respectively, on either side and then we're done. Now to pull the bumper back a bit. Reinsert the spoiler base and hand tighten the nuts. Don't worry about getting them perfect because we'll manually adjust the spoiler shortly. With the nuts loose, manually lower the spoiler so that it's reinserted all the way. With the spoiler reinserted, visually inspect for gap consistency and make sure it's perfect before hand before completely tightening the nuts. Be careful not to over torque them because otherwise the bolts will turn. At least they did for me on the left. 
Once the spoiler is even, manually extend the spoiler one more time. There are clips that go in on the reverse. So we want to clip those in first. We want to squeeze the middle. And run, finger it along the bottom to make sure all the clips are engaged. Snap it on. Before we put it in its final position, we do one last test run. And check the gap. Beautiful. Paying attention to the gaps and, want, and the holes, we can insert it and take a look from this side to make sure. Reconnect the wiring harness. Nice click. And pay attention to where the bolts are placed relative to the holes. We want them right about in the middle. Now for adjustment on the other side, we can see that the other two bolts control the height. So this is a good height at which to secure it and holding it flat against the top. The bolts are pretty much in the middle. We will secure them. I'm securing the middle one first. Enough tight enough by hand to hold it in place. We'll observe that the gap is nice and consistent all around the tail light. And there's a nice even gap along the bottom as well. It's really easy to position them and make them ugly. A less than ideal fit. Starting on the farthest bolt, tighten it into position. That's the hardest part. Do not over tighten. Similarly, start on the right. Double checking the position of the tail light. It's good, gentle, no over tightening. No need to over tighten. The right hand side is the same process using eight millimeter. Adjust the outside most bolts first and tighten a little bit. Next to the top and the middle. Now as for the trim, we get our trim out and we have those three clips. Let's remove this trim. This goes over the bolt hole. The black circle goes over this bolt. Plastic installation piece or over the bolt here. And that's our rear camera, reverse camera wire. Same for the right trim piece. Teeth go under this trim. And congratulations, that concludes the rear bumper chapter. Onwards to the rear camera installation. Let's install the rear camera. We'll start with the bumper removed and show how the camera is installed into the bumper. Then we'll show you exactly how to run the rear camera wire into the car, through the inside, under the center console, and into the head unit. Optionally, remove the bumper. If you want to make the rear camera look like it came from the factory, then remove the bumper. See the previous chapter for a bumper removal guide. Alternative cameras can be installed that go into the license plate light or that go under the license plate itself, and those alternatives will be linked in the description as well. If you choose an alternative camera, you can skip this step. Service mode. If you have a Boxster, it should be in service mode because we'll be wiring under where the convertible top is stored. I have a full length step-by-step -step walkthrough available on the channel. Measure and drill. If you removed the bumper, measure the halfway point and make a hole. The resolution of the camera I chose isn't the best, but what is, is the wiring, 
being trim and small and four pinned for easy insertion, and how it's reliably mounted into the bumper with a large hollow bolt. Align the camera at the angle you want and fasten it internally using the nut. Remove the trim panel behind the left tail light. Trim removal tools make quick work of the push clips holding the trim panel in. Remove the middle trim panel that is in between the tail light trim panel and the rear trunk closest to the engine. Also remove the rear center trunk trim panel. The end result should look like this. The 987 has a grommet that's sealed and does nothing on the left side. If you pop this grommet out, it exposes a hole just big enough, perfectly behind the taillight opening that we're going to use. Pop it out while not cutting yourself on the sharp metal body on the inside of the circle that gets exposed. Insert the rear camera wire through the exposed hole in the body and feed it into the car through the inside using the vent hole to assist you. And it should rest on this pillar here because the license plate square is going to end up right about there. I actually want to wrap this inward. Go reach in and find our rear camera cable here. And start pulling it a little inwards. So it rests inside the car and doesn't interfere with the bumper. Wiring through trunk into convertible storage area. Tie the head unit side of the rear camera wire to a long, thin tool. I used a hex bit extension. The head unit side of the rear camera wire will have a trigger wire and a male end of a yellow video composite cable. See where the suspension is attached to the car? Feed it through on the immediate left of it towards this padding. Push and prod a bit until it comes through on the other end. And if we peel this back, we can see exactly where our tool is. Ta-da! Let's put the bulk of it inside the car, and then we'll gently tug it through. Inside the trunk, only leave as much as we need. This is going to go under the carpet, so we just pull it through. Once pulled through, the wire goes under all of the trim that also handles water for you. Be sure to put the trim back in the correct order to maintain water drainage protection. Filming angle could have been better here. The foam pieces are not that difficult to remove or work with. They come right up. When you're done, you should have a wire poking into your cabin for the next step. There we go. Underneath here. Correcting the wire a little here. And tucking it in the rest of the way around this engine compartment here. Through the center console. From another angle, wire goes this way. Under the black thing, under the carpet, through the center console. Running the cable through the center console area is easy. You just put it on the side of everything not to interfere with the shifter or anything like that. Then I gathered the cables in a circle and zip tied it and stored it away inside of the head unit area. And with that, the rear camera is wired in. 
we go under this metal. The rear camera wire zip tied away. Tucked behind everything carefully. And here are our connectors. Car side, and ready for us to connect to the head unit. With the existing aux cable, I decided not to desolder it and destroy it since it did not impact any functionality. I'm just going to zip tie it and tuck this away. On the Boxster S2006, and I surmise similar models, the brown is ground and the blue wire is your reverse light wire. I asked my dad for help confirming, and he was nice enough to put the car in reverse and out repeatedly, while I had a voltmeter on the wires to test. Let's put the voltmeter here, put it on continuity. At first we can check for ground and touch something metal. And we have the brown wire, we found ground. Now we adjust it to 20 volts direct. Put the red one in the blue wire, which we think is the reverse light. Touch the ground, which we know is the brown. 13.8 volts, and we're sticking it in the blue wire, but don't touch the two contacts. Now to make absolute sure that it's the reverse light. Dad, can you put it in first gear or neutral, please? Neutral. Now, the reverse light is definitively off at the top in the white. We check again against this blue wire, red, and the other brake lights might be on. But this one is off. We found our reverse light. Reverse one more time, please. No reverse. We found our reverse wire. I recommend still doing your due diligence and double checking that the brown is ground and the blue wire is reverse. Porsche loves using brown as ground. Confirm the wires and tap into the wires however you want. I used Amazon T-junctions. I'm not going to recommend them 100%. It's a bad uh, connector here. Yeah. The, oh, there it is. These crimped connections. Who did those? Uh, I just, I was able to slide it out. And you see, and I, like, I can stick it in, stick it out. It just comes, goes in and out. And uh, you should solder this, solder this one. Okay. Yeah, make it nice solder connection here with this one on, so that this never happens again. On the head unit, it will depend on the head unit, but there will always be a yellow female connector as a receptacle for the video feed from the camera, and there should be a labeled reverse camera trigger wire that the trigger wire gets wired into. I used a T-junction for this as well. In the future, I'm going to redo this connector as an automotive plug, so things are more reliable while remaining plug and play if I need to remove the head unit. For now, the T-junction connector has worked well. Your specific head unit will have its own specific documentation. The Xtron shown was poorly documented, and it turned out to be the brown wire. This is required for manual transmission 987s. The Xtron CAN bus decoder can decode the reverse signal on automatic transmissions for the 987, and you shouldn't need this wire based off of forum posts with other people's experience for the automatic transmission. Firewall protection. At this point, if everything has gone smoothly test-wise, I recommend taking the time to protect your rear camera wire. Since we fed it through the body, and the body has sharp edges with a grommet we removed, I recommend this kit, or rubber paste that hardens into rubber applied around the wire so the sharp metal edges don't cut the cable over time while you're driving. With everything working, tested, and protected, you can reinstall the bumper and all panels. If you have issues, see the appendix on troubleshooting steps. My rear camera worked sporadically, and using a TV and an AC adapter, we managed to wire the camera up to a wall-mounted TV and find the issue. 
Let's cover how the cellular and GPS antennas are installed. The first step is to pick the spot where the antennas will go. You'll want to install the antenna under the top portion of the windshield cowl so it doesn't get covered by the front trunk. You'll also want to avoid any moving components like the windshield wiper mechanisms. The second step is to mark one of the cables. This will be helpful later. Remove the 13mm battery hold-down bolt on the passenger side of the battery. If it's not disconnected already, disconnect the negative battery terminal and tuck it away into a safe location. This will let you slide the battery towards the passenger side of the car. Moving the battery over will expose the large grommet that we need. From inside, that will look like a large padded grommet directly above the gas pedal with the wire coming out. It's easy to remove the grommet from the firewall. Some instructions might say to push the grommet in. Okay, I'm upside down inside of the car. And with your left arm, you can push it through into the other side. And that should make your life easier. But what I found actually works better is pushing it front into the frunk to make the slit using a razor blade and screwdriver. Successfully GPS through and do the same for the marked LTE antenna. So now we take both of these antennas and we find that opening that the grommet came out of and we put it through the opening in the car. more all over the way through. So the grommet was actually pretty easy to reinstall with one hand. I'm back inside the car. I'll do my best to film and show. Basically, the foam pad peels back here. Then you, with one hand, you can push, you push it into the car from the front inside into this area. You peel this foam back and then you feel around for the lip. Once you get the lip on the firewall, it's actually very easy to reinstall the grommet. It pops right back on. You go around the circle. The grommet gets reinstalled successfully. Just prepping and installing where the antennas are going to go. We're going to rely on the built-in adhesive. If it ever fails, you can always use damage-free stickies or good old-fashioned glue. And it's inside and attached. Press it down for a little bit to let the adhesive do its thing. And for the GPS, now we just make sure the wires are all the way through. And I realized I routed my GPS antenna wrong. So now I'm just going to make sure that it goes around the windshield trim. So that if you ever have to remove your cowl, it's not in the way. LTE antenna. GPS antenna. Boom. It's a little difficult to film because how I'm upside down right now. So I'll just hang outside of the car and show you. The antennas go, I'm gonna put them over this AC line, back through the back of the head unit, and then just route them into this back area. So you can get the cables through by basically putting one hand on the left and touching for gaps around here in this plastic area and with your right arm you feel for gaps here and you should feel the cables through next to the thick wiring harness as your reference and then i was able to use touch to feel a hole I managed to push these two through and now we're just going to cable manage and 
connect into the head unit. I think I'm not even going to cable manage. I'm just going to leave them like this. Because that's actually not that bad. But if you do decide to cable manage, and if you have excessive length, then you don't want to coil it like so. You want to fold it back and forth like so. On the head unit, the connectors get connected to GPS at the top and 4G at the bottom. Remember when we marked our cable? In the Is It Worth It section, we'll cover features, different behaviors compared to the OEM head unit, and share if it's worth it. Features. Standout features are worth mentioning. The screen is amazing. So amazing, and high resolution and large in fact, that the rear camera actually looks a little hazy since the image is so blown up. CarPlay is a little buggy on rare occasion, almost never, but having it in the first place brings my 2006 Boxster right into 2023. The UI is customizable and immersive, although to be honest, I don't use the native head unit UI often. I use mostly CarPlay. We'll use it more when we put in offline maps. USB is a great one. You can put literally hundreds of gigabytes on a USB stick and leave it in the port and play music for literal weeks. Thanks to installing this head unit, I can place calls comfortably from my vehicle. I can pair my phone when the car turns on instead of having to manually press a power button on a 12 volt plug adapter because the Porsche 12 volt sockets stay on for some reason. And the sound finally lost that horrible fuzziness that I had with the old iPod aux connection on the OEM head unit. Those were the main reasons I upgraded. Everything else is a bonus. Speaking of sound, the sound is limited to two channel audio if you use the fiber optic box, but based on my usage so far, I'm pleased with how it sounds. The built-in microphone is good too. People can hear me on calls and it's pretty clear for them up until the point when I'm going 50 miles per hour with a top down while on a phone call. It also does this weird thing where it decreases the volume of the call the faster I go so I can't even hear the other person talk if I have the top down and go fast. It has an equalizer, and all of those settings are available. I'm not an audio specialist, so I'll leave it at sharing that that's available. This is an Android head unit, meaning you can install any application you want. Since it's Android, you can also install launchers, which basically means you can change what the home screen looks like. I was able to install Amazon Prime and watch Vikings while safely parked. Out of the box, the radio tuner could use some work because the interface is confusing. There's an out of the box phone app that I haven't used at all because I use CarPlay, but I do connect via Bluetooth and that enabled wireless CarPlay after I connected using regular CarPlay. And on every press with wireless CarPlay, there's a brief delay, but otherwise it works perfectly. Differences in behavior worth noting are the following. For power, the original head unit could be powered on for a short time. It saved its last powered state and kept it. Next time you turned on your car, the head unit would still be on or still be off, and you had to use the power button. With the new head unit, you have to have the key in the ignition for the sound to work, and the head unit powers on when you put the key in the ignition. You can still turn the head unit off by pressing on the power button. After a few months of using this head unit, I learned that it scratches. Do with this information what you will. I'm planning on using it until it's unusable, then replacing it with an upgraded model and installing a screen protector at the same time right from the start for the second head unit. I wonder if the OEM Porsche Communications thing plus module scratches this easily.
I swiped like this on accident with my fingernail a couple of times. Camera is not doing it justice. There we go, a couple of deep ones. Noticeable in the sunlight. Overall, there are a lot of things that I love about this head unit. The screen, the functionality, the wireless CarPlay, the Android application flexibility. But there are a few downsides worth mentioning, such as the lack of documentation and the installation challenges and the imperfect fit using the provided clips. If you're willing to overcome a few installation challenges, 3D print your own rails for better fitment, then this is definitely worth it to save over $1,100 over the OEM head unit. Plus, you get wireless CarPlay and a rear camera. See the appendix because it's going to have steps on how to overcome installation challenges. I want to give a big thanks and a big shout out to Don Eilenberger for his thread at Planet9, the CAI store guide for removing head units, and the countless other random threads that already exist for inspiring this guide and providing complete solid references. I want to say thank you for their hard work and their determination in documenting what they learned. It's easy to make mistakes when you solder. Shown here is a common mistake to avoid if you're soldering two wires. What you want to avoid is twisting the two wires together, holding the solder over the wires, and pushing the solder into this abomination. The right way to do it is to hold the soldering iron under the two wires that you're soldering together until they heat up. You press the solder into the wires, not the soldering iron, and the wires, which are now really hot, melt the solder. Why do we do it this way? When you solder the first way shown, you're not permeating the connection with solder. Also, there might be gunk or coating on the wires. When you fully heat them up, like in the correct way shown, you fully permeate the connection with solder and make it reliable. To set up Wi-Fi, navigate to the home screen and navigate to settings. Wi-Fi is on the left-hand side. To enter the factory password from settings select factory, a prompt should pop up. Go to a Mac or PC and download any 1280 by 720 pixel image to a USB stick. Plug the USB stick into one of your two new USB ports. From the factory menu we just unlocked, select boot screen logo. Your image should appear here. If we select it, it will change our boot screen logo. The Extron head unit supports wired and wireless CarPlay. It's essentially plug and play. You plug in your phone, set it up with wired CarPlay by opening the Carbit Link app, and you're good to go. You'll want to make sure your phone is connected to the head unit via Bluetooth. On startup, the Bluetooth automatically pairs to my phone and Carbit Link opens because it was the last app that was open, and wireless CarPlay loads on its own with the help of Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Home takes you to your Android launcher. All takes you to settings. Music opens the head unit music app. Phone should open the phone app, but mine does nothing. Car changes your screen's brightness between three levels. Nav opens the head unit maps app. Back takes you back in menus and such, like on Android. And the SD button is secretly not a button, but is a port where you can plug SD cards in, loaded with music or anything else an Android unit is capable of. Currently, there are no good options for changing what the buttons do. I'm actively researching this. If I find anything out, it will be in as a reply to the pinned comment on this video. I would love to change the music and nav buttons to better applications. Here we will show you how to adjust the illumination of the buttons below the screen, especially if yours came red from the factory, instead of white for whatever reason. Navigate to the lantern settings from settings. Here you will see the settings for the colors. Thanks to the Planet 9 thread, some recommended settings will be on the screen now. If none of these work for you, you might have to play around. Here is my end result. Offline maps will be helpful for navigating in the case that you don't have your phone with you, but have GPS built into your car thanks to this guide. You won't need to pay for a cellular plan. This video is already long, and offline maps might end up being an involved process, so subscribe and check back for the video on offline maps. When I make a full guide, it'll be posted on the channel under videos.
The MOST fiber optic box is highly functional and delivers great sound. A shortcoming is quality control. The signal wires for the left and right channels come over crimped from the factory, leading to broken connectors and non-functional sound. We're going to cover what to do and how to repair this. We share what the replacement connector is called, what tools and parts you need, and the procedure. We'll explain how the connector is wired, what to do if you make any mistakes. Parts and tools. The connector took a bit of searching. It is a Micro Molex 3.0 connector. I have a link in the description to the parts you'll need, including the connector and pins that go on the wires. Next, you'll need a crimping tool. You'll need something to strip the audio wire. I recommend getting replacement audio wires to give yourself additional length of wire to work with. The copper wire inside the provided connector turned out to be so thin that even though it shouldn't make a difference to carry the signal, I was concerned, so I used a replacement connector for a guaranteed lower impedance. We need a soldering iron, a voltmeter to test the connections, and heat shrinking to protect our hard work. Understanding the existing plug. The existing plug on the fiber optic box is a female connector, male pins. So the replacement connector will use male connector, female pins. Now the pins and what they do. The lower row is yellow, black, red, which is 12 volts ground ignition. The upper row is the left audio channel, audio ground, and audio right channel. The grounds on the audio connector are spliced. Prepare the audio connector. On the fiber optic box, they combine the ground. Using either the original cables, or better yet replacement cables, remove the shielding and solder together the ground, making sure to heat shrink the results. We want an end result of a single ground wire that we can crimp a pin on. Crimp wires. On the crimper, it's the 22 to 24 setting. This is important. Don't over crimp. I made that mistake on the first connector and it all fell apart because I crushed the wires. Apply a gentle, soft, medium amount of force so they don't tug out but don't fall apart. Test all wires by giving them a tug on the connector. I ruined a connector and had no way of getting the pins out and was glad I bought two connectors to allow for mistakes. I had no way of getting the connector pins out because the de-pinning tool was too expensive. Buying two connectors to allow for mistakes was cheaper for this project. Insert into new connector. Once all wires are ready, insert them into your new connector. Just to confirm again, it is female pins on a male Micro Molex 3.0 connector solder into head unit. Once the repaired connector is ready, you are good to go to integrate the fiber optic box back into your head unit. The audio connectors get connected and the wires get soldered into B+, ground, and ignition appropriately. That's it for the fiber optic box repair. Enjoy your working audio. T-junction connectors, or T-taps, are particularly useful for plug-and-play applications like head unit installations, where the existing wires get tapped into, forming a T. I did not particularly like this kit, which I will recommend despite its shortcomings, and I'll explain shortly why. Let's cover how to reliably connect them, because they can have issues because of how they're made and because of the crimping involved. To properly install, take the tapping, circular end, and press it onto a wire. Press the wire into the cutting metal part from both sides using your fingers. And this is where the first problem occurs. The taps in this kit do not always cut through into the wire, which might cause issues. If it looks like it's almost in, take a small, flathead screwdriver and force it in the rest of the way. Then close the connector. If it didn't even tap the wire at all, pull the wire out, be careful not to rip it, and then press down again and force it in with a small flathead screwdriver. The other end of the T-tap is the player joining the party. That connector, in theory, gets crimped on, but in practice is loose, unreliable, and causes issues. I'll show you the standard way of installing it, and then the new and improved reliable way. Standard method. Insert your wire that's getting a tap connector. Using pliers, squeeze down, and the wire should be crimped. Why this stinks. Pull on the wire. In theory, the crimp should be solid. Maybe I'm just doing it wrong, but doing it this way gave me nothing but problems. The, oh, there it is. Crimped connections. Who did those? Uh. Soldering for reliability. 
Take your T-tap mail connector and remove the metal prong from the housing. Put the housing on the wire. Strip a decent length of wire. With the housing on the wire, yes, you're bound to forget it at least once or twice like I did, wrap the stripped wire around the metal connector and solder it down. Once soldered, push the housing back on and then gently crimp the housing onto that. Now, despite your best pulling, unless the wire rips, that connector is going nowhere. I had to do this fix for the rear camera connectors on both ends and for the fiber optic box connector, and that's been reliable using this method. Shooting. Which component is really broken? First, we suspect the power uh, voltage, which might be dropping when the rear lights turn on because of their too, too high wattage or something like that. So we're substituting the power supply to the camera uh, from the wall. Power supply, 12 volts, stable delivery. And then we are substituting head unit with the TV, which has AV feed. And we mix and match different components to find out the faulty one. You've connected everything and it still doesn't work. These are the power cables, so we want to ensure we have enough slack. This is how you jerry-rig the AC adapter without frying everything. So we got it working earlier. It was probably not clasping this green wire well enough for us, but just did. So red goes to power and black goes to ground on the camera side. So we connect the power wires to this. And then we put the red wire. This is really safe. With the AC plug, oh, it's out of focus. We connect the ground wire around the ground here. That metal oh, barrel right. is the ground, or the wrapper, the ground wire around it, and insert the positive plus one. Ground wire goes around, yeah. So ground wire goes around and the positive one is inserted inside so that the insulation, all the way to the insulation so that they don't accidentally touch. The PC. Insulate everything that you see. <laughs> and scotch that one too. So that it doesn't the red one? come out. Yes, to hold it in place securely. So it, why am I drop? Might we don't want the connection to be uh, jiggling around and unstable. We want a stable connection, as it would be. <laughs> we need scotch tape. Everything. Okay. Something obviously is not connected somewhere. And that expression of complete disbelief and misunderstanding, that kind of expression moves the humankind forward. You know, I can hear the gears clicking in the head <laughs> from <laughs> this. <laughs> <laughs> That's so annoying. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, that's how monkeys became human. There it is. <laughs> okay, one down. I taped it to the table. Taped. No wires stick out from the middle. No wires must be sticking out there. Now you tape it. So that no wires stick out. And no, no chance of short circuit. Okay. Not even a remote chance. No, nothing. So have we connected video feed at all? Yes. I kind of doubt it because it worked 10 minutes ago. It worked 10 Oh, oh I went with bad connector. There you go. Oi. It's a bad uh, connector here. Want to wave your foot in front of the cat? Oh wait, no, we don't want to wave our See, foot. See, now it's gone. It's a bad connection. Bad connection right here. That's all it is. The, no, there it is. That's the crappy one, I think. These are the crappy ones. The crimped, tea spice. Crimped, crimped connections are crap. Who did those? You sorted, you sorted this one, right? Yeah, no. Oh, wait a second, why is it? Oh, it's, it's, it's one solid wire 
which you have soldered to a flexible one. That's that's actually a normal way to connect it. Yes, but um, this crimp connection, I just I just I was able to slide it out and it just came out. So there you see, and now I can I can stick it in, stick it out. It just comes, goes in and out. And uh, you should solder the solder this one. Okay. Yeah, make it nice solder connection here with this one on, so that this never happens again. According to Isaac Newton, net force is equal to mass times acceleration, which means that if you've upgraded your head unit in your 987, then chances are you're lugging around a navigation DVD reader in the front trunk that's pointless and dragging your beautiful car down. Even if it's light, the navigation DVD has mass. To accelerate it, that force needs to come from somewhere. That somewhere being premium gas that you pump and pay for. That somewhere being acceleration you could otherwise be enjoying. Let's remove the navigation DVD, since we've upgraded the head unit and don't use DVDs for maps anymore. Obtain fiber optic loop bypass. First, obtain a female fiber optic loop bypass. Use the link in the description if you want to get one that's sure to work and includes a male and female version in case you need flexibility or another in the future if you decide to remove more components. Remove DVD and brake fluid covers. Remove the navigation DVD reader. I removed my plastic trim for demonstration purposes. Definitely not, because I figured out that you can remove the DVD without removing these panels only after I filmed this. Anyway, there's a little tab that presses in on the DVD reader. Simply press that in using a long screwdriver and it should be removable. Install bypass. With the reader removed, if you do a test of the head unit, you'll observe there's no sound. That's because we broke the fiber optic loop if you had bows installed from the factory. Install the bypass on the orange cable. This will complete the fiber optic loop and let sound and data travel once more. Reinstall. Always test your handiwork. With it working, replace the covers and you're done. Results. As we will see, the weight is not super significant, but it's three pounds that we're never going to have to carry around and pay for again. Replacing the default confusing radio application will be a future video. Since it's an Android head unit, there's a lot of promise with future flexibility. Stay tuned to the channel for that video when it's ready. If you made it this far, thank you for taking the time to watch the whole video. If this video helped, which I hope it did, please give it a like and subscribe to support the channel. Let me know if you have any questions or comments below. Otherwise, see you soon.